talking about the first one, not the second one. Although I play Rust the game also, it's very interesting, but I'm not as much time on it as I do on the Rust programming language. Uh, the agenda for this talk, um, it, it's um, yeah, right on this slide. So a quick intro about myself and also about Pipit and what we do. The technical goals of Pipit when we founded it two and a half years ago or so because that mainly determines how you want to build it, what tools you want to use to build it, and, and if it is the, the right um, language and the right tools to use um, to achieve those goals that you set out. Um, so we'll go through some parts of it. I did want to go through every single part of this, but after I'm building out the, the slides, uh, we'll be here all night. So I just picked out a couple of them. Um, we'll go through the web framework, the database layer, and then I think event sourcing as well. And then if there are any questions or anything else, I'm happy to just address them. And, and also please just jump in when you need to, um, to ask questions about anything. Um, I did want to go through a deeper dive into network calls um, because for us, that was one of our main goals and one of the things we thought would be very useful um, on our platform and um, to build very fast services. And then finally, we talk about um, what we plan to do um, with Rust on our platform going forward. Uh, so about me, I started my career in Accenture, just working on a lot of software engineering projects um, around the UK, um, mostly in Java. Um, I was trained in, in Java and uh, built just a lot of features in it, and then started thinking about other languages, um, did some C Sharp and some C, C++. I really like getting lower and lower to the, the computer level and did some assembly as well. That was maybe a bit too low and it just took a lot of time to build anything. Um, at Curve, um, I switched away from Accenture to work on more startups just so I can see uh, my efforts and, and how it actually impacts the customer. And you move a lot faster as well uh, with, with startups. That's when I started hearing about Rust and started discussing with my fellow engineers at Curve and, and it was, as low level as C or C++ in a way, but it doesn't give you that ability to just destroy everything. Um, so with the type checking and, and, and everything else in place, you can't do the things C gives you, but it's a lot less risky with it. So it, it got my attention straight away and I started just exploring the Rust programming language from then on. Those two are my main resources that I use. And when I first started getting into it, uh, once you Google Rust programming language, the, the book on the left is probably the first one that comes up. And I think most people have probably gone through that one. Uh, it has a lot of information on just a lot of different parts of the language. And, and it got me to a competent enough level. Um, but my focus was to build a microservice and a, I had to follow on with the second book on the right. So microservice with Rust. And that was um, a bit more specific to my use case. So I was happy to, um, to use that as a resource also. Um, and so then combined actually gave me most of the knowledge I, I needed to, um, to build up a this platform. If you have read both, both of them already, then this talk will probably be a, a refresher course for you. Um, so before going to the details, I always like to just um, highlight this tweet by Kelsey Hightower. Um, he's a developer advocate um, with Google. Um, he does a lot with the HashiCorp platform, which is what we use for our DevOps and tooling. I'll probably go into that a little bit, uh, but he says that the thing you're trying to build should be more exciting than the tools you use to build it. Um, so basically what you're building um, should excite you a lot more than how you're building it. And that's something I, I truly believe in. I'm probably in the minority of, of engineers who feel that way. Uh, but I do think that what you're building should be more important than how you build it. Um, so I'll discuss a bit more about what we're doing at, at Bipit. You can tell this slide came straight off our sales deck. It's much nicer than the rest of the engineering stuff. Um, so at Bipit, we are uh, providing a, a financial well-being platform um, to employees as a employer benefit. Um, so financial advice is, is very, very expensive in, in the UK and in Europe and probably in, in all of the world. Um, you have to pay hundreds of pounds in the UK to talk to a financial advisor and most wouldn't even talk to you unless you have 50,000 pounds at least in your bank account because they, they get money off of your um, assets under management. And so by using technology and um, open banking and a lot of other tools we have in place, we've reduced the cost so much that we can give it for free to the employee and through a financial well-being platform um, by the employer. Um, that was a very like one sentence uh, 
description of what we do at BIPIT, um, but you can go to our website if that sounds interesting at all and just to learn more about it. Uh, we recently came off the Tech Stars program in Berlin. I would have really loved to go there and, and just hang out with all the, the tech, uh, the 10 companies who were picked out in that program. Um, but because of COVID, yeah, we couldn't make it. It was a complete remote um, um, accelerator, which was the first one that Berlin has done in a very long time. So what were the goals we did when we first started to build Bipit? Number one, we wanted a very reliable platform. Um, once you use it, you should barely see any errors at all come up. Every functionality should work seamlessly, even for the very majority of, sorry, even for the very minority of use cases and very edge cases, um, they should all work. Like nothing should, should, shouldn't, um, should come up with errors. This proved a bit challenging, because open banking, um, which is an implementation of the, just in case um, this isn't aware, it's an implementation of the PSD2 um, in, by the EU, which pretty much means every account service provider should be able to provide user, their user data to anyone who has access to it, who has been given access to it. So if I have my data in uh, my bank, say Santander, and I give permission to um, this app, to just look through my accounts for me, Santander should be able to give all of my data to the app because I, I told Santander that they have my permission to do it. And so that's one of the ways that we use to um, create financial and um, to make financial advice a lot cheaper. So we get access to this data, we automate a lot of that process, and then uh, we can just give advice um, at, at a very, very cheap rate compared to the current standard industry. Uh, but as if you've used open banking before, you would know it's not 100% um, reliable. It's at best 95% SLAs is what they have. So there's a bit of work to do there to make sure we still have a functioning service um, as much as possible. Number two, we wanted really fast services. Um, 99, the metric we use to measure this is that the 99th percentile um, for any API call should be less than two seconds. And that was very important for us. And um, so a lot of decisions we made in terms of what crates to use and how to build it was based on, on these two metrics um, specifically. And the third part, it, it should be extensible. So any, any features can be easily upgraded and extended to include just a lot of different um, services and functionality on top of it. And one thing I would like to point out is the use of um, ADRs, which are architecture decision records. Um, they're used to document just any decision that you make on an architecture or technical basis. Um, I would highly recommend that if, if anyone is, is deciding on patterns and um, APIs, um, architecture, that you use this um, just to record it. Because usually six months down the line, you have no idea why you picked one thing over the other. Uh, and you probably think, oh, I probably wasn't thinking right. And then you go and switch it and it, it brings this whole merry-go-round or I'll switch back. Um, but having this in place, you know, the different solutions you considered, the approaches um, you liked from one over the other and why you picked one um, over the other. So we have um, ADRs for every decision that we've made from the beginning of, of BitBit. So it made it a lot easier to actually um, build these slides um, here today. Um, so just a few of them that I'll go through about why we decided to use some crates um, instead of others and when we, start, when we built BitBit from the very beginning. Um, so this is a roadmap of what we've done. Um, in the early days. Uh, so we started experimenting in BitBit uh, in late 2018, just writing our Hello World service, um, mostly actually building the infrastructure behind it. Um, so we use HashiCorp tools um, for our microservice-based architecture. Um, it's a nomad service for the orchestration, a vault service and for secrets management, and then a console for um, service-to-service -service, um, communication as a service mesh. And so that's mostly what was built in, in Q1 of 2019. And then the Rust services came on top of that. Um, so I have, we had our very first Rust service in production in, uh, right before Q2 2019. And if you've played around with, with Rust and, and their SDKs that are available with third parties, you very soon realize um, it's, there's not enough out there um, for all the surprisingly like very well known and well used um, APIs. Um, so we had to build some of our services in Java just for that reason. The main one was um, Firebase. And um, so we use Firebase for our authentication mechanism. 
um, but there isn't any SDK for, for Rust. Um, so we had to create a different service in Java and then integrate all, all of our services um, with it when it needed to talk to, to Firebase. And this use case comes up quite a few times. Um, another example is with our analytics platform. Um, so we use Mixpanel and that also doesn't have a, a Rust um, SDK. Of course, you can always uh, just communicate directly with APIs, but it also comes with a lot of challenges, um, especially around the authentication mechanism between our platform and their platform um, when everything is already inbuilt in SDKs. Um, so again, we would, we would just go ahead and because it's a microservice architecture, we would build it all in Java or, or any other language um, where an SDK exists and then integrate internally with our Rust APIs. Um, so I would say at, at this point, about 90% of our services are in Rust and that 10% is um, for any third parties we use that don't have REST, um, don't, don't have Rust SDKs. And, and, we, and it just didn't seem like it was worth building a Rust SDK so in, or integrating directly um, with their API. Um, so we do use Risotto to integrate with some AWS services. And this is when we started thinking about event sourcing, but we didn't go into it in too much detail until 2021 actually, which I'll get to later on. Of course, there was the big async await upgrade, um, which meant a lot of uh, changes to our, our services. Um, and, and then in our goal to make things a lot faster, we tried to, we introduced a connection pooling also to the database layer. Uh, we got to over 15 Rust services in 2020. And at this point, uh, we are, we're over 20 actually um, Rust services in, in production. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through some of the crates that we use and why we picked one over the other. At the very beginning, we had to decide on what we use for our web framework. And, and there's school of thought was we would either go with a low level crate, uh, examples to the bottom left, hyper or request. Um, requests, I guess you can call this low level, but it's actually built on top of hyper, uh, but it doesn't give you too much. It's, it's just, a server and a client implementation. And then to the right, you have a more framework um, solutions. Um, Ion, which was the dominant one when we had to make this decision, I don't think it actually exists anymore. I think um, development has stopped on it. And but there are others like um, Actix and Rocket and Tide and, and a few more. Um, so the, these were the things that we're considering. If we go with a low level crate, we can easily access the core functionality um, of things we want to do that if we went with a, a, a web framework itself, we would have to wait for that to be included in it. Or you could maybe um, extend it and add it to it and then try and merge it back in, which creates just a lot of like development process on top of that. And also it's easier to just use the new features of Rust if it's a low level crate, because those get upgraded first. And um, because a lot of the, the other web frameworks are built on top of the lower level ones. Um, I think every example I have on the right is actually built on top of Hyper. Um, I might be wrong on Actix. Um, I'll have to check on that one, but I believe they're all built on top of Hyper. Um, so we ended up going with, with Hyper um, as our solution. Um, it's the main reason, the number one reason for that was because of um, async await. When we started it out, async await wasn't in the um, in stable Rust. And we wanted to get there as soon as possible because um, we knew how important that was. Just writing code, um, without it, it was just so difficult to read. And, and even for new engineers joining the project, it, it was difficult to understand as well. And we had to go through a lot of training process. Um, so that was the number one reason to use Hyper. And as it turned out, Hyper was upgraded um, with async await about four months before the web frameworks were. Um, so that four month period is quite a long time to have to wait um, once it was actually released by um, the Rust language uh, um, at the time. I'll go through one more kind of scenario that we were thinking through when we started out. So we had to think about our database layer. Um, what crate would we use to just access our, our DB? Um, and and ex same thing here as you would see with any other language. You could either go with the whole um, ORM solutions or with a native driver. Uh, in my experience, I've mostly been going with ORM solutions uh, this was in, in Curve and in, in Accenture, just because it's, 
it's an easier model um, to, to map things. Um, once you create your, your model, you can have it easily map into your, your tables. Um, it's mapped into your, um, your API models as well. And in that integration, that syncing is, is, is very easy. You just save. Uh, most of them have like a save method and everything is just synced um, simply like that. Whereas you have the, the native driver solution and everything needs to be done uh, manually. You write all the native queries and you, you uh, have to build all your tables from scratch and, and write all the queries for every single thing. Of course, you can do it in ORM as, as well, but in ORM, you're, you're trying to avoid that. Um, and then in the native driver, you actually have to do all that. But of course, by using a native driver, they're, they're really, really fast. Um, one of the things we looked at was um, diesel, um, which was an example of the ORM in Rust against a native solution. And so we went with a Postgres DB. Uh, so we're comparing Postgres versus diesel in terms of execution, execution times um, to run these queries. And I don't have the link here, but um, Postgres was, was a lot faster using the Postgres queries compared to diesel, mainly because diesel did not support um, async at the time. Um, so everything had to be synchronous and when making calls to, to the database. Um, I haven't looked at this recently. And um, the last time I did was a couple of months ago, maybe a year, but even then async still wasn't in diesel. I feel like they should have it right now. Um, otherwise they're really, really behind. Um, but if anyone can correct me on that, um, yeah, I'm happy to, to hear. Uh, but that was our reason for going with, with Postgres. But there's a second element to it as well. Uh, we wanted a connection pool because with database connections, most of the time is, well, unless you have like really, really slow connections, but you're, you're making multiple calls to your database usually. And, and just opening up a connection just to make a call or, or a few calls and then to close it, it just takes up a lot of, of resources, whether it's time or it's memory or, or CPU, just a lot of different resources that makes it, that, that isn't very optimum. And it goes back to our goal that we wanted to create a very high performance service. Um, you click on a button, you try and do something, uh, it should instantly get the results for you. And you shouldn't have to wait too long, even for the, the very um, low minority like edge cases. Uh, and it's why we had to inc include um, the connection pooling to it. But before async await, there was R2D2. Um, so that would give you a pool of synchronous connections. Uh, so then that also went through an upgrade process of getting that from a synchronous pool to an asynchronous pool of connections. Um, so Postgres together with, with BB8 builds up our database layer. Yeah, so I did leave out a couple of them because it was going, taking a bit too long to, to go through. We'll be here for a very long time to go through every single one of our decisions, but I'm happy to come back and, and just answer questions on the rest of our decision process and if needed. But I did want to go through a deeper dive of our network calls because uh, once we included tracing, um, we realized a lot of our time was actually being spent um, in, in this part of the system. And because it's a microservice-based architecture, you have a lot of different network calls happening um, within the system itself. Uh, it's why we, we were yeah, focusing on the network call. Um, so in your typical LAMP server, which you probably wouldn't see anymore, you would have your database and, and your application server on the same physical computer. Of course, you wouldn't need any network call in this case. Um, you just access it directly and then get any data you might need. Um, few people would, would have this use case anymore. And this is definitely more, um, more standard um, right now. So you'd have your server sitting somewhere in the cloud usually and your application would just make a call over there, get some, some data, update some data, and then return that to the application server. The more services you have, the more this scenario comes up. Um, so you have a couple of microservices, um, so like app servers in this diagram, sitting on physical nodes, um, server one and server two, all making requests to um, databases to get data. Um, with the number of hours, you can see they keep increasing. Um, there's so many network calls happening between them. Once you get to 20, which is where we are, just there's just so much happening and so much time spent on the network. And it's why we, 
we had to we spent most of our time just looking at how we can make that process very efficient. And um, so this led to our template um, Rust service, uh, which is I'm going through a detail of some of them, and um, but just to go through all of it, we pretty much built our own web framework um, on top of Hyper. Um, that uses all of these different ones. So at, at the very beginning, um, we used the Tokyo as the event executor. Um, of course, now Tokyo isn't really the standard anymore. Um, you can have the standard in async, uh, but one, when we started, Tokyo was the only candidate. Um, I'm still waiting for that convergence or, or maybe a higher layer on top of that where uh, you don't really need to pick one of the other. You can just use um, either one of them. Um, I think it has started, but it hasn't really happened just yet. Um, so most of our, well, all of our services now are built on, on top of Tokyo. And as I mentioned, um, the main reason for that, it wasn't actually a decision to make. Well, just because we used Hyper and Hyper um, is built on top of Tokyo. Um, so Hyper acts as the application server and builds out um, also the, um, the HTTP clients just to connect to, to everything else. EB8, which I, I discussed um, already, um, so that creates an, an asynchronous pool of database connections. Uh, so you can just go pick up a connection, use it, and then put it back in the DB pool. Um, so it never gets closed. It's always open, always available. You use it, give it back, use it, give it back. It saves just a lot of resources in that process. Um, took your Postgres as well. Um, these are linked to other crates uh, which form the base layer of, of our, um, our services. Uh, Resuto, which is very interesting. Um, so at some point we realized HTTP calls are, are quite, it's, it's interesting. So you can use it um, and, and it does sort of synchronize your calls because you have to wait for a return and then you can, you can finish it. But you want more event sourcing for some scenarios. Uh, this, this requirement came in a couple of months down the line. Uh, so we started looking at what tools were available. Um, I'm a big fan of um, AWS. Um, so it has both the um, SQS and SNS um, solutions. And when combined, can give you a, a very useful um, event sourcing solution. And uh, not just in terms of like queue processing, but just combining the two, you can have things like um, sending out emails or um, pushing it into Lambda functions or um, even push notifications. There's just so many different use cases that, that can come up from just using those two solutions. And so it made sense that we can build our event sources on that and then extend it um, when possible, when our, our more use cases come, come about. Um, so if anything doesn't require um, a response immediately, they get pushed into an Amazon um, SNS queue, Amazon SNS topic. And then from there, it, it's all based on configuration of what, what you want to happen next. Um, in terms of processing the events, they will usually go into an Amazon SQS queue and that will get picked up by, um, by another Rust service, which is also built on, on the Risotto. So using the SQS module on that crate um, it's able to just pull up any messages in the, in the SQS queue, process it, and then go back and, and delete that message off the queue. And then um, some additional things uh, as well. So survey for JSON um, handling, it just seemed like the, the easier solution to just, in terms of formatting of messages between any service at all. Um, a JSON instead of using something like XML or, or just any, anything else. And plus any third parties are usually in JSON as well. So um, once you build it internally, there's not much to do to integrate externally also. And then slog for um, logging or structured logging. And um, there wasn't much competition also when, when we started. So this was the standard. And I still think it is the standard in terms of structured logging, um, but to include tracing as well, there is so much more solution. Um, so our solution here was, and um, we would use structured logging, create our own top side type of um, properties. Um, so a message ID, a causation ID, a correlation ID, and then that will be used for tracing um, across the entire um, network and infrastructure. 
there's there are much better solutions now and things like I think open tele telemetry and um, there's a second one that I can't remember right now, but if you want to actually see a graph of your entire trace and something like Yega would, would give you that, uh, using something like a structured log won't be enough. And this is the next thing that we're looking to do, uh, not just having it in the logs, but being able to visualize exactly how uh, the messages are, are um, sent across the entire um, estate. Um, I think I will skip this part because no one writes code before async awaits anymore. Uh, but you can see it's very, very complicated to before async awaits. You have a lot of eaters left and right and A's and B's um, just to, to make a call to um, an HTTP in service. Yeah, so we are async. Um, and this is the code from the previous one that makes it a lot cleaner. Of course, there's a lot of unwrapping, uh, but it's just a, a test to show like how we focus our services to make like highly efficient HTTP calls and, and then to process that quickly. Because um, I think that was number two on our goal. Like it has to be really, really fast. So it just created a very, very quick um, client that connects to one of our services. I think you can actually see, and I don't know if you can see my mouse point, but if you can, you can see the URL, which just points to our dev server and then uh, makes a call there. Um, it creates the, the request body, it makes a call, sends it, and then um, it gets a body. And that's the get version call that's used by this, um, this program over here. So you can see it's using the Tokyo um, executor. It calls the get version, which is the one I showed previously. And it has a duration and, and the result of it. It also calls the duration of the actual program itself. So the duration of the call is stored in duration one, duration of this program is stored in the duration variable. And at the end, it, present, it prints out the result, the duration and the duration of the program. Um, so this is just to show the kind of network um, efficiencies we got out of um, using Rust async await. So that's um, the result of running that program. Um, so we get a version of, of the server. Um, it took 170 milliseconds to make that HTTP call and the program took 170 milliseconds to, to complete. Of course, that's just one call. Um, so you would expect the program to be as fast as your HTTP call. There's a slightly uh, longer version. You're making three calls to the same HTTP clients, uh, which is the first code I showed. Um, to get the version. And um, they're all done synchronously um, using yeah, async await. Same process here again, you calculate the duration and then print out the duration of the program. And, and this usually confuses a, a few people. Um, so you are using async await, but it is running synchronously. And so the duration of the program is pretty much a sum of the network call of each of the call, so it's it's a synchronous call to each each um, of the HTTP calls that were made, um, and it's because of the, the await keyword. Once you hit await, you're you're waiting for that um, to finish, and then you would continue. Um, so we use a lot of different techniques, the spawning combinators, to actually make use of um, async await and and Rust green threads. Um, so in this case, uh, we are joining all three of them so that they're executed asynchronously. And then as before, calculating the duration of this program. And then when you print out the results, the duration is equal to the maximum duration of any one of the, um, the HTTP calls. A little bit more just because the program is, is doing something extra. And so this forms the basis of almost every part of um, BIPIT's platform. Our services are mostly working over the network. And, and in order to get the best performance, we always have to make sure we are doing asynchronous calls when, when possible um, to get all the data we need and then return that um, to the caller. Um, so you'd see a lot of um, spawning and combinators everywhere if you just need one 
you'll just select one and not wait for the other. If you need all of them, you'll join them all and, and then um, wait for that execution to finish and then put them all together. So what's so unique about this? You can get things like that in a lot of different languages. Um, so what about Rust makes it so special? Um, so the way I see it, there's this three parts to it. There's that uh, robust nature of, of the Rust programming language. You still get all of the error handling um, that you can get even without um, the network calls. Um, you have to handle them. You don't handle them. It's your choice not to handle them. And if you don't, um, you are aware that you're making the choice not to do it. And then there's zero cost to it. Um, so with a lot of other languages, there's a cost to actually have threads, whether it's a memory or, or, or just anything else. And with Rust, it's a zero cost to have this. And, but for me, the, the most important part of it is that it's a lot easier to, to write and to read as well. Um, by, by using this, you can pretty much write um, asynchronous code as, as easy as you would write synchronous code. Um, I'm not sure if you've been through this before, but uh, in my experience, if you try to write some threads or, or try and uh, make some parts of your program asynchronous, you're always told by someone else, another engineer on a team that keep it as simple as possible. If you introduce threads or, or try anything else, you just make it more complicated and more uh, reason to bring errors. Um, which I think this, this eradicates that uh, and you can start using it um, as easy as you would if you weren't using it. So just those, these two lines of code, um, which is a cutout from the, the previous um, program, makes it, turns it into an asynchronous program. Um, so it's, it's, it's literally just two lines to include and then you get so much more um, from it. So you save so much more time by executing this. And it's what I like to understand as fearless concurrency. Um, so you don't have to be afraid to, to just try and, and run these asynchronous programs. You can just, just do it um, by, by using very simple lines of codes. And the takeaways we got from building everything in REST. Um, one, yeah, your API server is as fast as the amount of time you spent on, on your, it all depends on how you architect it. I guess from our, our perspective, the way we architect it is almost everything is over the network. Um, so once you've taken care of the actual query speeds of the data you're querying, um, and, and that's definitely the first thing you should look at. So you shouldn't start looking at a network when your, your um, queries are taking a couple of seconds to run. Um, it, it wouldn't make sense at all. And so you first look there, optimize your queries, uh, make sure you're caching when you need to um, and all of these other things. And then you can start looking at how much time are you spending on the network um, to, to get all of that information. And then um, as I mentioned um, previously, so you can use one and Kubernetes and then you can reduce the time you spend on network calls a lot in your services. And it's really, really easy, um, especially since async await has come up just to uh, write these concurrent programs. Um, so you should be able, well, I would expect to see them a lot more um, in, in Rust going forward, rather than just having synchronous code all the time. In terms of what worked very well for us, we had a lot of fun building it, um, especially at the very beginning when, when Rust was very, very uh, new, um, you had to dig very, very deep into it just to understand what's going on and then and then to experiment with so many different crates before you decide on using one. And you also have to try and guess or have some sort of speculation on what crates will still exist and what wouldn't. And if it doesn't exist, are you happy to maintain it going forward? And because there's a few crates that we use that isn't maintained anymore. And then we've had to and take it and maintain them and privately, although we're now looking to put that in public as well and, and push it back into and the public domain. Um, but that also takes a bit more like development resource and time, um, which is why we haven't done it just yet. But the goal is to um, get it back into um, an, an open source um, version of it as well. Um, there's a lot less errors. Um, so we push out every single error on our production service into um, our alerting systems. Um, uh, Slack is, is one of them, just so we can have uh, like a live view of exactly what's happening. And I think, Usually you would 
see, if you were to do this in any other company, you would see hundreds, hundreds of errors every day, um, just because it, it does happen quite a lot. Um, but by using this solution, by using Rust to build it, we, we, we barely see anything there. So every single error is pushed onto our alerting system and um, it, it's barely, barely ever getting alerts just because you have to handle it. If you don't handle it, you, you know, you're making the decision not to. And we have really, really fast APIs. Um, I think I've, yeah, this is a time snapshot, which, which isn't the best uh, reflection on, on showing that how fast it is. So I, I will get to maybe a, a longer time shot and, and put them maybe on Twitter and just um, to show that as well. Um, but the 99th percentile is um, for that snapshot is less than 400 milliseconds, which means that the slowest of the slowest of the slowest of calls was still like 400 milliseconds. Um, our goal was to get it under two seconds. Um, so when we first saw this, we were extremely happy. It has gone up since. This is um, a little bit an older snapshot that I took. Um, I will get a more up-to-date one and put that up. But I, I do think the 99 percentile is around one second um, for BIP at the moment. And then of course, um, we use a very little resources and reduced resources means um, less cost. Um, if you're familiar with HashiCorp Nomad, you would know that that's how you would um, configure your, your service um, within um, a node. And these are our production configurations. Um, so we just use about 64 megabytes, 250 um, of our CPU, um, and we are running production um, service on this. So our costs, our infrastructure costs are very, very low because you can pack these applications onto one node and then only have um, a couple of nodes. And we only have three, and, and you can even use the, the cheapest of them, whether you're using AWS or uh, which, which other um, it's a provider you have. You can get the cheapest one and still pack a lot of into it. Um, of course, you want to maybe spread a little bit in case a node goes down. Um, so you have a different node that has the application running. Um, there's a lot of different considerations to make, um, but it makes it a lot easier if it's very small running um, services. It gives you a lot of options on um, how many nodes you need, where to pack them, and then it saves you a lot on your engineering budget to put somewhere else. And what didn't work so well? I think the lack of SDKs, that was something we noticed from the very beginning and we still continue to see as well. Uh, if you're using a lot of third parties, usually they wouldn't do a Rust SDK uh, in, as one of their first, second, third, or even fourth options. Um, and it's why I would recommend, a, a, if, if not a microservice, there is this whole macro service architecture where um, you do have most of your logic on, on like a bigger service and then you have tiny services um, that do more specific stuff. And one of them is usually just a different language as an SDK that wasn't available in the language that the main one is doing. Um, I think it's called a Citadel approach, um, but I haven't I looked into that in quite a while. And then the lack of options for tooling. Uh, it took quite some time before we could actually find something to run um, to get a code coverage of our unit test. Um, a lot of it actually makes use of um, unstable Rust, uh, the, the nightly versions. And once you use stable Rust, you, your options go down by quite a lot. Uh, Tapolin was what we use um, for code coverage. And, and even then, there is so much that goes wrong and you have to always upgrade to the next version, the next version, because there's a use case that isn't counted for, and then you have to upgrade because there's something else that isn't um, counted for. Uh, so you don't have a lot of options in terms of tooling. That, that's just one example that I gave that we, we went through, but there's been a lot of others and that made us realize um, on a different language, um, you would have a lot of different options to, to solve a problem and based on your use case. And then the amount of time to be, to be proficient. Um, it's, it's quite some time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I prefer to like read books and then to, uh, to learn from it and to practice with it. If you're, you're like that, you realize yeah, it does take quite some time. And if you prefer videos, maybe that's, that's, not, that's not as slow, maybe it's a bit faster, um, but uh, with Rust itself, I have found that it takes a lot of time to become proficient. And it, it's not so much right now, but definitely at the beginning, hiring was more difficult just cause it, it wasn't very well known. But now I think because of 
meetups like this, um, it's just spreading um, the word and the usefulness of, of the language. Um, it's become a, a lot easier actually to hire for it. And then the wait for async, yeah, that, that was a pain. And even going through the refactoring um, of it, at the time, 10 different services all had to go through major refactoring because it's a breaking change. And there are a couple of things which will possibly break in changes going forward as well. Um, hopefully not. I think the async traits is one that I'm hoping won't be, uh, but yeah, we will see. Uh, was it worth building it all? Uh, it's yes, definitely. Um, mostly because of the, the robust nature of the language, uh, the all, the entire error handling of it, and also how fast uh, and, and very little resources it uses. What we are looking to do next is the top of our priority is async traits. Um, we are looking to, we, we currently use the async trait crate, um, which does give you traits um, with, with async. Um, but it means other queries don't work together very nicely with it, especially with macros. Once you have macros together with async trait, it usually breaks the macro. And so we, we've had to do a lot of work to find a specific macros that work together nicely with async trait. So we're waiting for the, the official version of it um, from Rust. And, and that's uh, probably the, the number one thing that we're looking forward to. Um, other things is um, Rust in ML, uh, machine learning. Uh, it isn't very mature at the moment, um, but we are looking to use um, the clustering model, which is more mature compared to other parts of it. Um, so it's, it's, we've been ex just kind of experimenting with it um, to see if um, it is something we can use or if we have to use something else, I don't know, Python or, um, or R or just or something um, that's more mature. And then smart contracts. Um, yeah, it's, so the whole solution is on a blockchain. So we, we want to, and this is very, very far out. Um, there are a few blockchains and Concordia being one of them that have smart contracts that you can write in Rust. And, and one of the things we are looking to do, and this is um, something that we are we're not like planning immediately, but just out in the future is to have uh, most of our advice models on the blockchain. So it's public information and then um, they can get updated and get used um, by others as well. Um, but this is something for, for very, very far away. Although there's already work um, in this space uh, in Rust, um, whether it's um, on the um, Polkadot or, or on, actually it's not on Polkadot, on Myota or, um, or a few others, they are working on it already. And, and there's actually, they're building SDKs also on top of things like um, Cardano. And so we're looking forward to that. And that's, that's the end of it. Um, I hope I didn't spend too much time on it. Yeah, okay. Uh, for any questions at all, please do let me know. I'm happy to go through it. Even if I didn't cover it, um, anything you would like to know in our journey, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to go through it as well. Thank you, Eric. But I have a question. You kind of answered it already. So uh, basing the whole company on Rust, uh, how hard it is to get a talent, especially uh, maybe what kind of stuff are you looking for? Are you uh, are you willing to train from scratch or uh, like what kind of background are you looking for? Yeah, I remember having a conversation with, with Luca. I, I think he had a, a talk here as well um, a couple of months ago. And um, so he was also hiring some Rust developers um, for True Layer about a year ago. And we were both struggling to find actual developers with Rust experience. And um, so we discussed uh, what, um, what experience was close enough to Rust that will be happy to train, or will be easier for the developer to train and understand Rust. And we both had the same idea that C or C++ is probably the closest one. Um, the main reason for that was because of the whole memory management part of it. So you have to be aware of how memory is managed and with Rust, although you don't manage it yourself, you do have to be aware of it. Um, so you know when you lose um, um, a, a variable and when you don't. Um, so that's, that's definitely what, um, the, the, I, I would say the, when you write down a job description, you say, ideally you want Rust experience, but you're happy if you have C or C++ experience. Okay. Thank you. Uh 
There's a question, uh, when do you think uh, we will see a Ruby on Rails-like solution for Rust? Uh, that's an interesting question, yeah. I was, I was having a look at the AWI web yet um, a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's still not to that level. Uh, I think it's still a way off. I'm, it's hard to put like a direct number, like a date to it. Uh, but if, if it's something you're waiting on, um, I would say maybe start building it yourself because it might be, be uh, easier. <laughs> <laughs>